Hi, everyone. Um, I would like you to take just a few seconds to consider what an ideal language learning environment looks like to you. What are you doing in that environment? What are your students doing? What does that feel like to you? I want you to just kind of consider that for a minute and what you would like in your ideal language learning environment. I'm going to suggest that um, most likely some of the things that you see here would be what came to mind, the idea of students interacting with each other in the target language. Um, they're engaged in a variety of ways. Um, the teacher is guiding the students. Um, students are taking risks with the language. These are pretty common um, ideas that language teachers have. And I want to suggest that by flipping your lessons, um, which isn't really a new concept to language teachers, but it does provide some of the affordances that you're looking for in your ideal classroom, in your ideal learning environments. So um, while we've very briefly addressed why you might choose a flipped lesson approach, and we'll get more deeply into the, to the why also, um, in this uh, webinar, we'll be exploring what flipped lessons actually are, um, how to make them most successful uh, to reach the learning targets that you have. Um, you'll see with the, the online part of this lesson, which is embedded into TED-Ed, that's where you're going to discover the technologies that you might consider for flipping your lessons. So the, tech, the specific technology ideas you'll be getting later on in the TED-Ed lesson. But in this video part, um, we'll be referring to um, the different kinds of techniques um, you might use for formative assessments um, and explaining the characteristics that make flip lessons work. Um, I do refer to flip lessons and not to classroom, and that's very, very much on purpose. Uh, for a lot of people, the idea of a flip classroom, flipping everything, can be really overwhelming. So I recommend that you start slowly, you choose a few lessons maybe for each unit, and eventually you'll come up with an actual completely flipped classroom. You also, if you have a colleague, a uh, trusted colleague, you might uh, have them flipping a few lessons for each unit, and you're flipping a few lessons for each unit, and then you can share, divide up the load. Um, there's no reason for us to be working alone or reinventing the wheel. So I encourage you, if you have colleagues that you work with, to, to do some of this together. Okay, now to kind of get into the heart of things, um, you probably recognize this, it's Bloom's Taxonomy. It is a little bit upside down, but I think it's a really good representation of what the true idea is behind flipping lessons. So it's not about doing homework in the classroom and classwork at home. What it's really about is the lower order thinking skills. These are the skills that students can do at home, the remembering and the understanding aspects of learning that they're capable of doing on their own. And they can maybe get that through video lessons or book lessons or any combination thereof. Um, then the important part is that you have some kind of assessment to find out how well they learn that information, not just for you to find out, but something that gives them feedback so that they know how well they learned that information. Then when you have time with your students, that's where you get to these higher order thinking skills. These are the parts where students really need our support. These are the parts that they can't do on their own. So in the in-class or the synchronous parts of, of learning, that's where you'll be um, helping your students to really apply the language to create in the language and so forth. So the idea of flipped lessons is really about students being able to work at their own pace and learn in the ways that make sense to them because you've given, given them a number of resources for learning and getting that lower order thinking skills part down so that they can actually um, use the language at higher levels. And if you think about how your lessons are created, you probably have a lot of scaffolding at the beginning. That's the lower order thinking skills, the parts that prepare students to do what you want them to actually complete. And then what often happens um, 
in in class sessions and synchronous sessions is you end up spending so much time on that part that you don't get to the interactive um, engaging activities that are at the end of your lesson and that's if that's what we say is is ideal for our classrooms and we need to make sure that we get to that part so by taking some of those lower order thinking skills outside of the classroom we can make sure that we're getting to those engaging parts that we want that that really define what our ideal classroom looks like so let's talk for for a minute here about building lessons and what that looks like. So how do you do that? How do you know which parts? If you look at your, um, as far as choosing the content that you're gonna do for the independent learning, if you look at your lessons um, that are scaffolded, the parts that um, you might be uh, teaching a structure and you find yourself slipping into English, those are great things to have outside of, of synchronous time. Or vocabulary, uh, holding up flashcards. You don't need to hold up flashcards. Those are things that students can do on their own to practice. So take those parts and break them down into small learning chunks, maybe five to eight minutes long. Then once you have those chunks separated out, you can, um, create a some sort of a concept check and those are the parts that that created online give students immediate feedback when they get immediate feedback they know better what they did and didn't understand it also because it's digital gives you feedback which can impact your choice in your lesson design you can see that for example um, number three was especially difficult for the majority of my students. So go back and just reteach number three. Don't reteach the whole lesson. The concept check is really essential for this. Um, and technology today allows us to be able to do that to give the students the feedback that they need to know what they don't know. Um, to give you the feedback that you need so that you know what students don't know. And by doing that and only addressing those issues, it gives you more time in the classroom and it gives you um, the, the feedback that you need to really address the misconceptions that students have rather than going over the entire lesson and having half your students who get it, because we always have those students that get things right away, those students um, can, can don't have to be waiting for all the other students to catch up. So um, it allows students to practice on their own as many times as they need to until they get the concepts that they need to know to then be able to move forward when you're doing synchronous time with your students. Um, so let's take a little bit of a reality check on this. Um, there are some myths about um, flipped lessons. One of the myths is that you need to create all of your own videos. That's not true. Um, first off, you can give students a number of different ways to learn the content, because the reality is it doesn't matter how they learn it, it matters that they learned it. So you might give them a video, you might give them textbook reading, you might give them both. You can give them a combination of materials that they can use and then let them choose how they wanna learn based on their own learning styles. You may find that many of your students choose multiple means of learning the content and that's great. But you don't need to create all the videos yourself. You can look for some of them on YouTube. You may find, um, a variety of materials already exist out on the web. Now, in doing that, I also recommend that you set a time limit for yourself, just like you set time limits for your students in terms of, of in-class practice activities. Set yourself maybe 20 to 30 minutes time to search for the content already that already exists. If you don't find it in that time, then go ahead and create it on your own. And the reason I say that is because you can fall down that rabbit hole of spending hours searching for materials that you could have just created on your own in less time. Um, if you have a textbook that has a super site, super sites are wonderful for lower order thinking skills. They're the perfect solution to getting that, those materials out to your students for them to practice, uh, to learn the, the content before they're applying it where they need your help. 
So that's a really great place to look also. Um, the idea that grammar is never taught in class is, is really not true. Uh, you will teach some grammar points in class, but you're doing only the ones that you figured out through the concept checks that your students struggle with. You don't want to reteach everything because if you do, your students learn that they didn't have to do the work on their own at all. So be careful about that. Um, yes, it takes a lot of time at the beginning when you're creating your own content and you're trying to figure out even just the, the ways in which you want to do that, but then it lasts forever. And it also saves time when it comes to the interactions in class. So you're getting to those engaging activities uh, and you're doing a lot more facilitating in the actual class time. So those are you know, some of the, the concerns people have um, regarding the setup for, uh, for flipped lessons. Um, you will find that you uh, have uh, fewer questions um, up front. However, you will have that more time to practice, which is really what you're after. Um, there are a number of publications on flipped lessons and flipped learning. The majority of them are not specific to languages. Uh, however, there are some case studies um, and analytics do indicate some of the highlights that you see here of the positive impacts for students and instructors should you choose to go with flipped lessons. So it allows students to choose their own path for learning. That's where you give them a lot of resources and it really doesn't matter how they learn it, it matters that they learn it. For the instructor, you're only going to review those misconceptions. You don't need to teach everything because students can learn a lot of it on their own. Um, students really like the fact that they can go back and, and rewind and revisit these lessons before they, um, before they take tests, for example. Um, students ask better questions when they come to class because they already know what they don't know. Uh, more time uh, can be applied to, uh, applied to practicing the language and connecting it to real life. So those are ways that um, it's really helpful to move to this format and get to the ideal learning environment that you're looking for. So key ideas include um, the fact that it really informs learning and teaching for, um, through those concept checks, which are, are the key to making flip lessons work. It provides opportunities for differentiating for different learners to learn in different ways. Um, it gives you time in class so that uh, your students uh, can actually practice and connect with the language. So thank you for listening to this part on flipped lessons. And as I mentioned, when you get into the TED -ed activity, you will actually get uh, more information on the kinds of technologies you might use in order to create your own flipped lessons.